so terribly sorry about missing class uh, yesterday. It's okay. Um, you know, I think everybody these days is being a bit more conscientious about spreading their germs around. You know, but I was also like just really in no position to, to give lecture uh, even for the two hours that I had yesterday. So, um, yeah. so it goes. So, according to the schedule, I believe we're supposed to be doing lab four th this uh, today. Um, oh, wait. Both are applause. Lab four? <laughs> yeah, technically speaking, yes. Um, but, what is lab four? Um, well, that's the thing. Lab four doesn't exist. So because I have... didn't have time to write it because I was sick. So, we're not going to have a lab for. So, we would get an extra 100%. <laughs> what I'm going to do, uh, if I you notice, that. we were like scheduled for five labs, and then lab five is split into A and B. Oh. So, that's where I'm going to make up the difference. Four and five? Well, in terms of like, the grade scheme. Okay. So, the grades will still be distributed among five lab exercises, but like 5A will become lab four, and uh, lab 5B will become lab five, basically. That's what my plan is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, free week! Everybody go. No. Um, well, see, I thought that uh, in the first place, this might be a useful session for us to uh, iron out any, you know, any remaining problems people have with lab four. And further to that, um, I would like to, um, I'd like to continue on with the uh, demonstration of static, uh, static classes that we were doing um, last time that I would like to get to because, um, that's also, I, that, that's an incomplete example at the moment, and I would like, like, I'd like to get that out this week, the static stuff, and then, um, yeah, basically. Does that make sense? So, in the grand scheme of things, this time next week we will be having a test. Um, it will be a test in the same way as last time with a, uh, well, now, I guess it depends on, uh, hmm, looking at you, Steve. Um, I will consider that. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Steve, see how much trouble it is for him to get in for a test. Hopefully the, uh, the, the strike doesn't last that long, but, um, you know. So, what, which date is 20, oh, I, no, it's not So, um, Yes, we will have a test. Um, the test will focus on the material that we have covered since the last test. Um, so not so much of the early stuff, a bit more of the later stuff. Um, you know, arrays and loops and some of the object-oriented paraphernalia. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're gonna do. I don't test on stuff we didn't cover in class. That's a rule with me. So if you come to class, you should have a chance to pass. That's what I think. Um, so does that make sense? So far, so good? good. Um, <clears throat> I would like to um, do our example first, our, our continuation of, of static. And then afterwards, we can uh, we can talk about the problems people are having with lab three. Sound good? Yeah. Good. <clears throat> I don't anticipate that this will take more than an hour. So. So let's load up our. Um, 
Let's load up our code from the 2nd of November. In Unity, download the archive, open the folder, and extract all. Um, it'll it, it will uh, load it up um, relatively painlessly. Okay, but I have to create a project first in no. my Unity. No. Nope. You don't even have to open Unity Hub. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. last time using static values. We added a uh, number of enemies remaining variable to our enemy class. Now, can anybody remind the class what a static variable is? So, in the case of total enemies remaining, that's not a property of any one enemy. That's a property of all enemies. Right? So that's another way to think about it. A static, a static anything is not a property of one thing of that class. It's a property of all things of that class. Right? So, we can put this back together again. Uh, I didn't actually save the, uh, the, the changes that I made. I remember myself flagrantly saying at the, at the end of the last class, ah, it's only two lines of code. So let's put the two lines of code back in. Man, on Wednesday, it was terrible. I was like under three blankets and a house coat and like a winter hat. And I still was too cold, like my nose was freezing. It was, it was cold outside, but it was freezing. Yeah. Freezing yeah. rain. Oh, man. Terrible.
Joel Studio in Georgetown. Yes. Yes, I can. So it was the enemy spawner script that we've been doing. We've been doing all of this in. Um, so show and explore. Uh, all in the script. story. Um, so, <clears throat> there's one thing that I kind of noticed, which I think is um, useful. If you notice, here, blocker, shooter, boss, and bullet three fabs, right? If you take a look, on the script, right? You have a spot to be able to set default values from the script directly instead of um, having to attach it to an object first, which you know you could probably find a use for, um, especially considering the um, if we were to take these classes out, like the enemy class, and put it in its own file, that's still being loaded by Unity. So long as the script is in here, um, classes are available to be instantiated. So that would allow you to set default values in classes that are not attached to any game object. But, you know, let's leave that to the side for the moment. <coughs> All right, yeah, you're still, still loading. All right, I'm just gonna shut you down. Goodbye. Do not Costco, do not, do not collect the two hundred dollars. So, last time we had a public, oh, not too late, public static int remaining. 
every time an enemy is drawn, so you may name plus plus, and every time he's destroyed, we may name minus minus, yes. Um, this allowed us to do all kinds of fun things. Uh, for example, here, during update, we used to run this for each loop over our array of enemies to be able to tell how many, like, are all of them alive? Or is any one of them still alive? Now we don't have to do that anymore. Um, we can get rid of this entire block of code and just say, if enemies, enemy dot remaining is equal to zero, we draw the enemies, right? Because if there are no remaining enemies, then, you know, we reset them and we increment the level or something, right? So, um, so that's actually four lines of code and the deletion of a bunch of other lines of code. Can you explain it to me in the beginning? Yes, of course. So, um, here, we declare a new variable, static variable. a static variable, enemies remaining. Right? Here we're going to keep track of how many enemies there are across everything. Right? Um, the draw method is when an enemy becomes alive. Right? And in the damage routine, if the points are less than zero, that's where an enemy becomes dead. Right? So, we increase the number of remaining enemies every time we draw one, and we decrease the number of remaining enemies every time we destroy one. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Then, uh, so what that means is, by the time we've added these three lines of code, this thing now keeps track of how many enemies there are in three lines of code. This allows us, uh, this allowed us to get rid of a loop that was checking our array of enemies, um, and replace it with just a simple if statement based on enemy, uh, based on the number of remaining enemies. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Um, and this is actually this actually does better than that anyways. Right? Let's imagine that we had more than one enemy spawner. Right? Um, let's say we were spawning. You know, it's the type of game where it's throwing enemies at you from like three different corners. Right? And it's throwing random numbers of them. You're not necessarily going to have this nice, clean little array to be able to loop through to tell how many enemies there are. This might not be all of the enemies. Anything can create a new enemy, right? So, this now checks all of the enemies, right? Not just the ones that have been created by this class but it checks all of the enemies that have been created by every class because we have knocked that definition back up to the class that we're dealing with rather than this, this uh, more local class. Does that make sense? So, so static methods work very much like static properties. Uh, a static method is any procedure which applies to all, uh, which, uh, well, it's a procedure on static data, basically, that's available from the class and only uses things related to the class itself, not the specific objects, right? So a static method is not permitted to use any instance variables, right? <coughs> so, in our enemy class, for example, if I said public um, public static void report uh, remaining, right? I could say something like debug.log 
there are remaining enemies remaining. Right? But what I can't do is do something like uh, debug dot log and their max HP is max HP. Now, this might be because I'm using um, VS Code instead of Visual Studio and the plugin doesn't work very well. But once we come back to Unity, we're getting complaints that we're using a non static value within a static context. Max hit points, that is a static, that's a non static value, right? <coughs> One way to think about it, um, oh, I should probably initialize this to zero. There we go. One way to think about it, what's the max hit points of an enemy that has not been created? Zero. Are you sure? Enemies aren't created. It depends on the enemy. I mean, depends on the enemy is where we inherit different enemy types, right? Sure. The max hit points of an enemy that hasn't been created is like, it's like a null. It's like, that doesn't actually, the question itself doesn't make sense, right? Because it's only once we create the enemy that we set those values. That's why we're not putting an, an initial value up there, right? Because we don't like we don't care to specify a default value. That information should always be specified when the constructor is called. Remember, when you're dealing with static methods. The constructor may or may not have been called, right? The, the class may or may not have become an object, but you have to assume that it has not, right? So the fact is, max HP is not information that's available to a static method. It's just not there, right? It hasn't been created yet. So the information is there, but we might use it in the future, but we didn't use it yet. Right. Well, it's it's available once you create objects, yeah. right? But with respect to the class itself, it's meaningless, right? It max HP does not mean anything without an object to apply it to. Whereas something like enemies remaining, that does mean something even if there are no objects to apply it to, because it's a property of all of the objects. Max HP is not a property of all of the objects. It's a property of each specific object. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Um, so once you have a static, uh, once you have a static method, that can be called from any context. It's very flexible that way. So for example, I think the I think what I did last time in class, um, whenever we uh, whenever a bullet hits something, enemy dot report remaining. There we go. Oh. 
Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, that was just a little error on my part. Um, this is a reference to the currently instantiated object. Because this is a static method, there is no currently instantiated object, so you don't use the this keyword. Doesn't make sense. All right. Yep, there we go. Everything makes sense if you understand how everything's put together. So, if I shoot, you can see, every time I shoot, it's a static method. Precisely. It's, it's invoking that static method. But you'll notice that I didn't need a reference to any object, um, I didn't need a reference to any, any enemy object to be able to call that. All I needed was the name of the class. Right? Make sense? So, in our lab tree, so our class was house, village, and um, township. So, if we use the static method to apply one of the class, we can basically, and um, think about this, if we want to destroy one of the village, are, are you destroying villages? No, or, or maybe creating a village. <laughs> yes. So then, if the one village is created and we use the static method, so it would tell us like you know one village is created, and when the second village is created, it will tell us the second village is created, without basically. You could use it that way. Yeah, you could have the village class report how many villages created. are created. But getting the village class to like trigger something on that is a little trickier, right? Um, they hold information, but you should think of them as being passive. Actually, you should think of all classes that aren't like the mono behavior classes that are attached to game objects, right? <coughs> the ones inheriting mono behavior that have update, that have start. You should think of all other classes as being passive and not really doing anything unless somebody tells them to do something. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Good. So, now, um, let's move on to static classes. So, a static class is one that contains only static members um, or static variables and static methods, right? So everything in a static class must be static. Nice, simple, clean rule to uh, to write down, <laughs> which everybody's doing right now. So static class only contains static variables. Everything must be static. Correct. And and you cannot instantiate a static. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you're actually prevented from doing so by the compiler. So, think about it this way, right? With a static class, like, the purpose of something being static is that it applies to the class, not the object, although the object still has access, right? If you're a static class, that means there's nothing in the group of things that go to an object. So there's literally no point in objects. This, it's, just, it's just a class for a class's sake. So when, do, when does it, uh, when is it used? Well, in the beginning of coding before the user reviews the program? Um, there are a couple of different scenarios. Um, they're very useful if, when you need like a global pool of data, like something. You know how a global. You know how global variables work inside of one class, right? Well, you can kind of think of it almost like a super global variable, but it's still a class, so you can still control access. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create a new class that contains game information. So far in our, in our little shoot 'em up game, we have not displayed scoring, we have not displayed, um, uh, you know, 
what level you're on. Um, you know, there's maybe a life, you know, we, we, have, we didn't actually get to the part where the ship can take, our ship can take damage, but if we had, there would be a life counter, right? So for the time being, let's just focus on some kind of scorekeeping mechanism and telling what level we're on. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, I am going to do this just to prove a point in a new script. Create C-sharp script. This is different from the usual way that we create C-sharp scripts. Yep. Normally, we create them attached to an object. Yep. But in this case, we don't want to attach this, this C-sharp script to an object. Right? It's a static, it's going to be a static class. It's not going to be instantiatable anyways. So, we're just going to plunk it right there in our assets folder. So, let's call it... Um, Static. No, you don't want to call it a keyword. Uh, <laughs> score, score. Game, game info. Oh yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Or a scorecard. Mm. Oh, uh, yes. Visual Studio. Is this Visual Studio now? Yeah. <coughs> no, this is Visual Studio Code. Okay. So. In a couple of things. So we're now kind of past the point we have ascended and transcended Unity's starter code. The starter code is no longer useful when you're creating just a plain old static class. So first of all, there's no need for us to inherit from mono behavior. We do not want a start method. We do not want an update method. All we want is somewhere to keep some data. So we don't need start and update. Second, the class is static. So public static class game info. Now, we wanted to keep track of two things, what level we're on and how, much, uh, how many points the user has earned. Right? So, public static integer score. Public static integer level. Now, there are many different ways we can approach. Um, making things um, making things public like this makes it very easy to access things, but it uh, makes it so that we can't um, do certain types of safety checks and things like that. Um, so. I'm going to make this private. I'm going to make score private. The reason I'm making it private is so that not every um, not every class can directly access it. Because this is the game info. Oh, I should capitalize it because it's class name. Um, one question. Yes. Um, is there so with the static class. What is the difference between a mono behavior class and a static class? Um, well, static classes can inherit mono behavior. Can inherit. 
Five? Yeah. Okay. In this case, we don't want to because we don't need anything defined in monobehavior. Okay. Can we create a static class within the monobehavior? Um, well, you can create a static class inheriting monobehavior. So, so uh, the way that you would do that is colon monobehavior, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so remember that this is inheritance. Right? The same way that our boss enemy grabs all of the attributes from enemy, this class is now grabbing all of the attributes from mono behavior. But we don't need them. Okay. Right? Uh, we are just fine with just bare bones C sharp. C -sharp. Yeah. Um, we don't need a start, update, uh, start or update method. We don't need the ability to instantiate or destroy game objects. This is just a container for some associated information, uh, some information associated with our, our game in, in progress. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Okay, good. So, so I've made this private, which means that it must, uh, in order to access it, we must now access it through Methods. And let's um, let's just put in some initializing values. So <clears throat> public static void adds four takes uh, an integer amount points. Score plus equals points, but only if points are greater than zero. So we haven't really talked too awful much about how programming on a team works, right? The sort of industrial reality of programming is that you will often be required to program on a team with other people, right? Um, you may, at points, be required to program on a team with people who are not as good at programming as you are. You may be required to program uh, on a team with the worst kind of person imaginable, which is people who think they are much more intelligent than they are, right? People who think they're more intelligent than they are tend to try to exploit sort of little gaps that are left in the program. Like, for example, if I lead in the ability to decrease score, somebody might have a clever idea. Oh, well, on game over, why don't I just add score, but add a negative score that's all of the score that the person has, and that resets the score. It's like, well, yes, that would work. You know, that would look something like, you know, add score, game info dot, um, dot score. Uh, negative, sorry, add score, open brace, negative sign, game info dot score. In theory, that sets it back to zero, right? But if that's the kind of feature you want, you should have public static void reset, right? You should have a reset that does everything that you want to do, right? Score is equal to zero, level is equal to one, right? But when people are, you know, when it's, you know, it, when it's halfway through a Friday afternoon and people can only think about the video game that they that they uh, want to play this weekend, um, people tend to, uh, you know, sort of cut corners, shall we say? So 
the purpose of making things private and, make, and protecting things like this is to protect your code from other people, other programmers. So, so in this case, that's why you put it private instead. Mm -hmm. Anybody can alter it in any way they choose. We do want to provide the ability to alter it, right? It should be, uh, you should have the ability to, to add score, right? But there are certain, like, there are certain stupid conditions that you can get into, um, certain bad conditions you can get into if people abuse a, uh, a public variable people abuse a, a global variable like this. Um, like, for example, you should never have a negative score. Right? Obviously. Yes. With this, it's not possible for there to ever be a negative score. Right? Because it starts at zero and it can only go up. Yeah. Right? Um, another similar one for level is level should only increase one at a time. Makes sense, right? Um, we can put that one in quickly, too. Public static void increase level level plus plus, right? Now, once you've done that, private locks down both read and write privileges, right? So you need some way to read these variable these these variables once you've made them private, right? So very simple. You just write another method which only returns the value. Note that we're not writing to console. You know, we don't want to determine what it's being used for, right? Public um, public static int get score return score public static int get level return level so these methods simply re they certainly they simply grab the value that's currently in this in, yeah, that's currently private in this class and just kicks it out as a return value of the method. Right? So basically, we're restricting what goes in, but we're not restricting how things come out. But we could do that too if we wanted to. But we're not going to. Because this is already a complicated enough example. Right? So, So now, the question then becomes, how do we use this information, right? And also, um, it would be nice to have a way to, uh, to, to report this information, right? So public, um, public static, um, void debug import debug dot log um, level the level number dash dash score and then the score. So, if you're doing object-oriented programming, like, well and correctly, well, it's going to depend on the scenario, but if you're doing object-oriented well, you'll end up with lots of methods that are short, right? Each one of these things is like, at most, three lines long, two if you don't count curly braces, right? Short, tiny, short, 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 tiny. Tiny little methods. 
But once you use them in combination, they're very powerful. Right? But like all of you have written enough code at this point. Enemy is where we inherit different enemy types, right? Yeah. The max hit points of an enemy that hasn't been created is like it's like a null. It's like that doesn't actually, the question itself doesn't make sense, right? Because it's only once we create the enemy that we set those values. That's why we're not putting an, an initial value up there, right? Because we don't, like, we don't care to specify a default value. That information should always be specified when the constructor is called. Remember, when you're dealing with static methods, the constructor may or may not have been called. Right? The, the class may or may not have become an object, but you have to assume that it has not. Right? So the fact is, max HP is not information that's available to a static method. It's just not there, right? It hasn't been created yet. So the information is there, but we might use it in the future, but we didn't use it yet. Right. Well, it's it's available once you create objects, yes. right? But with respect to the class itself, it's meaningless, right? It, max HP does not mean anything without an object to apply it to, whereas Something like enemies remaining, that does mean something, even if there are no objects to apply it to, because it's a property of all of the objects. Max HP is not a property of all of the objects, it's a property of each specific object. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so once you have a static, uh, once you have a static method. That can be called from any context. It's very flexible that way. So, for example, I think the I think what I did last time in class. Um, whenever we, uh, whenever a bullet hits something, enemy dot report remaining. There we go. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, that was just a little error on my part. Um, this is a reference to the currently instantiated object. Because this is a static method, there is no currently instantiated object, so you don't use the this keyword. Doesn't make sense. All right. Yep. There we go. Everything makes sense if you understand how everything's put together. So. If I shoot, you can see every time I shoot. It's a standing in harmony with that. Precisely. It's, caught, it's invoking that static method. But you'll notice that I didn't need a reference to any object. Um, I didn't need a reference to any, any enemy object to be able to call that. All I needed was the name of the class. Right? Make sense? So in our lab tree, so our class was house, village, and um, township. So if we use the static method to apply one of the class, we can basically, and um, think about this, if we want to destroy one of the village. Our, Are you destroying villages? No, we're <laughs> maybe creating a village. Yes. So then if the one village is created and we use the static method, so it would tell us like you know one village is created, and when the second village is created, it will tell us the second village is created without basically. You could use it that way. Yeah, you could have the village class report how many villages created. are created, but getting the village class to like trigger something on that is a little trickier, right? Um, they hold information, but you should think of them as being passive. 
Actually, you should think of all classes that aren't like the mono behavior classes that are attached to game objects, right? <coughs> the ones inheriting mono behavior that have update and that have start. You should think of all other classes as being passive and not really doing anything unless somebody tells them to do something. Right? Make sense? Good. So, now, um, let's move on to static classes. So, a static class is one that contains only static members, um, or static variables, and static methods. Right? So, everything in a static class must be static. Nice, simple, clean rule to, uh, to write down, <laughs> which everybody is doing right now. So static class only contains static variables. Everything must be static. Correct. And, and you cannot instantiate of static? Like that? Correct. Yeah. 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 So um, you're actually prevented from doing so by the compiler. So think about it this way, right? With a static class, like the purpose of something being static is that it applies to the class, not the object, although the object still has access, right? If you're a static class, that means there's nothing in the group of things that go to an object. So there's literally no point in objects. This, it's, just, it's just a class for a class's sake. When, do, when does it uh, when is it used? Well, in the beginning of the program, before the user reboots the program? Um, there are a couple of different scenarios. Um, they're very useful if, when you need like a global pool of data. Like something, you know how a global, you know how global variables work inside of one class, right? Well, you can kind of think of it almost like a super global variable, but it's still a class, so you can still control access. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create a new class that contains game information. So far in our in our little shoot 'em up game, we have not displayed scoring, we have not displayed, um, uh, you know, what level you're on, um, you know, there's maybe a life, you know, we, we have, we didn't actually get to the part where the ship can take, our ship can take damage, but if we had, there would be a life counter, right? So for the time being, let's just focus on some kind of scorekeeping mechanism and telling what level we're on. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, I am going to do this just to prove a point in a new script. Create C sharp script. This is different from the usual way that we create C sharp scripts. Yep. Normally, we create them attached to an object. Yep. But in this case, we don't want to attach this script, this C sharp script, to an object. Right? It's a static. It's going to be a static class. It's not going to be instantiatable, anyways. So we're just going to plunk it right there in our assets folder. So let's call it. Um, no, you don't want to call it a P word. Uh, <laughs> score, score. Game, game info? Oh, yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Or a scorecard. Mm. Oh, uh, yes, Visual Studio. Is this Visual Studio now? Yeah. <coughs> no, this is Visual Studio Code. Okay. So, in a couple of things. So we're now kind of past the point we have ascended and transcended Unity's starter code. 
the starter code is no longer useful when you're creating just a plain old static class. So first of all, there's no need for us to inherit from mono behavior. We do not want a start method. We do not want an update method. All we want is somewhere to keep some data. So we don't need start and update. Second, the class is static. So public static class gain info. Now, we wanted to keep track of two things. What level we're on, and how much, uh, how many points the user has earned, right? So, public static integer store and public static integer level. There are many different ways we can approach things. Um, making things, um, making things public like this, makes it very easy to access things, but it uh, makes it so that we can't um, do certain types of safety checks and things like that. Um, so, I'm going to make this private. I'm going to make score private. The reason I'm making it private is so that not every, um, not every class can directly access it. Because this is the game info, oh, I should calculate it. Because it's a class name. Uh, one question. Okay. Yes. So with the static class, what is the difference between a mono behavior class and a static class? Um, well, static classes can inherit mono behavior. Can inherit, but yeah. Okay. In this case, we don't want to because we don't need anything defined in mono behavior. Okay. Can we create a static class within the map mono behavior? Um. Well, you can create a static class inheriting mono behavior. So, uh, the way that you would do that is colon mono behavior, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, remember that this is inheritance, right? The same way that our boss enemy grabs all of the attributes from enemy, this class is now grabbing all of the attributes from mono behavior. But we don't need them. Right? Uh, we are just fine with just bare bones C sharp. C -sharp. Yeah. Um, we don't need a start, <coughs> update, a start or update method. We don't need the ability to instantiate or destroy game objects. This is just a container for some associated information, uh, some information associated with our, our game in, in progress. Okay. Make sense? Okay, good. So, so I made this private, which means that it must, uh, in order to access it, we must now access it through methods. And let's um, let's just put in some initialized values. So, <coughs> public static void add score takes uh, an integer amount points score 
plus equals 0. 0.0. But only if points are greater than 0. So, we haven't really talked too awful much about how programming on a team works, right? The sort of industrial reality of programming is that you will often be required to program on a team with other people, right? Um, you may, at points, be required to program on a team with people who are not as good at programming as you are. You may be required to program uh, on a team with the worst kind of person imaginable, which is people who think they are much more intelligent than they are. Right? People who think they're more intelligent than they are tend to try to exploit sort of little gaps that are left in the program. Like, for example, if I lead in the ability to decrease score, somebody might have a clever idea. Oh, well, on game over, why don't I just add score, but add a negative score that's all of the score that the person has, and that resets the score. It's like, well, yes, that would work. You know, that would look something like, you know, add score, game info dot, um, dot score. Uh, negative, sorry, add score, open brace, negative sign, game info dot score. In theory, that sets it back to zero, right? But, if that's the kind of feature you want, you should have public static void reset, right? should have a reset that does everything that you want to do, right? Score is equal to zero, level is equal to one, right? But when people are, you know, when it's, you know, it, when it's halfway through a Friday afternoon and people can only think about the video game that they that they uh, want to play this weekend. Um, people tend to, uh, you know, sort of cut corners, shall we say? So the purpose of making things private and, make, and protecting things like this is to protect your code from other people, other programmers. So, so in this case, that's why you put it private instead. Mm -hmm. So if we put it public, then I think anybody can alter it using their code while they're working on the team or something like that. Anybody can alter it in any way they choose. We do want to provide the ability to alter it, right? It should be, uh, you should have the ability to, to add a score, right? But there are certain, like, there are certain stupid conditions that you can get into. Um, certain bad conditions you can get into if people abuse a, uh, a public variable, people abuse a, a global variable like this. Um, like, for example, you should never have a negative score, right? Obviously. Yes. With this, it's not possible for there to ever be a negative score, right? Because it starts at zero and it can only go up, yeah. right? Um, another similar one for level is level should only increase one at a time. Makes sense, right? Um, we can put that one in quickly too. Public static void increase level level plus plus, right? Now. Once you've done that, private locks down both read and write privileges, right? 
So you need some way to read these valuable these these variables once you've made them private, right? So very simple. You just write another method which only returns the value. Note that we're not writing to console. You know, we don't want to determine what it's being used for, right? Public, um, public static int get score return score public static int get level return level. So these methods simply re they certainly they simply grab the value that's currently in this in, yeah, that's currently private in this class and just kicks it out as a return value of the method. Right? So basically, we're restricting what goes in, but we're not restricting how things come out. But we could do that too if we wanted to. But we're not going to. Because this is already a complicated enough example. Right? So, So now, the question then becomes, how do we use this information, right? And also, um, it would be nice to have a way to, uh, to, to report this information, right? So public, um, public static. Um, void debug report debug dot log um, level the level number dash dash score and then the score. So, if you're doing object-oriented programming like well and correctly, well, it's going to depend on the scenario, but if you're doing object-oriented well, you'll end up with lots of methods that are short, right? Each one of these things is like, at most, three lines long, two if you don't count curly braces, right? Short, tiny, short, 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 tiny. Tiny little methods. But once you use them in combination, they're very powerful. Right? But, like, all of you have written enough code at this point to understand how, what a pain in the ass debugging is. Right? Debugging one if statement is much easier than debugging precisely. Debugging something like this. Like, you don't even have to debug it. Like, it's, look at it. Look, you can see it. You can just read it. It's, if you can't spot the error, it's like, you know, try reading it again, you know? Um, so that's also part of the really strong advantage of object-oriented programming. It makes the actual program statements compact and buttoned up and very small and easy to read and debug so that this stuff can be worked with much more easily. Make sense? So, now how to use. So, let's talk level first. When do we hit a new level? When we start a new... Um, when we finish one with one new... We destroy all endings. When we destroy all endings, yes. yes. So, let's go to the point in the code where we are doing that. Before right. the... Sorry? Question? question? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, of course. In the add score method, yeah. why do you need uh, if statements? Is there any minus points? Well, so even if you and I don't put anything like that in, because we know it doesn't make sense to have negative points, mm -hmm. um, um, Frederick the Terrible Programmer, 
who's been put up, assigned to the team doesn't necessarily know that, right? So when you're programming on a team, like you will have all kinds of assumptions and things that are true about the program in your brain, right? You will program in a particular way. Not everybody else is going to share those assumptions, right? So this is a way of enforcing your data policy. So <clears throat> the word I like to use for this is data policy. So you have a data policy, right? Because you said, well, I would never put something negative in there, right? That's a data policy, right? Everything has a data policy, right? Um, it's rare that you don't have some assumptions about what the data going in looks like, right? <clears throat> if you actually encode that in the program itself, it makes it much harder for people to misuse your code. Right? Does that make sense? So it's defensive programming. Yeah. So then why do you use uh, if statements in the in increase uh, level method? Well, like uh, if there is a remaining zero or something like that. I'm not taking any input, right? Oh. And this is only an increment operator. So it's always only going up by one according mm -hmm. to the method call. Now, we can do the same thing with the score method too, right? Yeah, but you know, if I, if, you know. If the fa Frederick is not in the situation, we can still do that, right? Yeah, uh, you mean like use the increment operator? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but like typically you want to increase your points by like two or three hundred at, at a time. So like oh, doing okay. a method called the plus plus, like you could make it work, but it's easier to just pass the number in. Um, so yeah, um, now this does not prevent someone from calling this like 50 times in a loop, right? There's only so much you can do to protect your program from misuse, right? And that's like, that's like kind of like a rule of humans generally, you know? Like if you think about any, like, any form of security whatsoever, um, it's always only meant, like, you should always think of it as a series of increasingly strong deterrents, right? Because anybody who's sufficiently motivated can get through any security system ever devised, right? So long as they're sufficiently motivated and clever, right? Like, locks on a house, right? Crowbar going through the window, right? Iron bars on the window, okay, can't go through the window unless you have an angle grinder, right? Like you, no matter what barriers you put in place, right? If somebody has the intention to misuse something, they, they will do it. Well, what you're trying to guard against is unintentional stupidity, right? <laughs> um, if you have a lock on your door, it is um, unlikely that someone who's drunk will come home to your house instead of theirs next door and, and find the door unlocked, walk in, start eating things out of your, out of your fridge, right? Um, <clears throat> so, yes, does all that make sense? I know this is like kind of esoteric and we're not really to that level and like we're all only doing individual projects so it doesn't really make sense yet but especially like the larger your project gets the more of these types of considerations you have to consider. Make sense? Yep. Good. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, I think this is quite readable. Don't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <coughs> So let's go in, enemy spawner, our update method checks to see if there are any remaining enemies, game info dot incre increment level
That's it. Right? That's all that's required. Now, just because there's no other place calling this, I'm also going to do game info dot, um, what was it, debug report? Just to be able to see some of the information going on in there, right? Um, what you would actually do at some point, you would hook up the debug, you would hook these values up to like a, um, a UI element on the canvas, but we haven't like really gotten into those at all, and you know, maybe if we have time today I'll show you, but I also want to get to your questions about, about Lab 3, mm -hmm. so um, if we have time I'll show you that, okay? So, increment level, good. Now, for, uh, for score, in theory, there's a couple of different ways we could take this, right? Um, each of the enemies should be worth a different point value. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So, Either, like there, basically there's a basic way to do this in a slightly more advanced way that uses overloading. Um, basic. Basic would be nice, yeah. Um, but I'll do the basic way and then I'll show you overloading. Because in theory I should also show you overloading for like curriculum and stuff. So um, going in here. Also it gives us something to do inside of these guys. <laughs> which are like mostly blank at the moment. Um, so in theory, every enemy should have a point value. Right? Now, should this be a static or a non-static member? This should be static. Why? Because it's going to apply to all... No, it's... Not an image because it's not going to apply to every every individual is different. Yes. No. Precisely. Yeah, it's not. Each individual uh, enemy will have a different. Well, could potentially have a different point value. Yep. In reality, we'll have like three different point values, right? One for the three different classes of enemies, but that's sufficiently different that non-static property, yep. right? So when the enemy takes a sufficient amount of damage and is destroyed, we wish to add that point value to the score. So, game info dot add score point value. And it's just that simple. Right? But here's the question. How do we get different point values for all of our different you have to declare the value. Where? In, in, in the draw method. In the draw method? No, it's um, in the game object, basically. You have to create in the enemies. What lines? Um, what line are you talking about? So, in the public enemy ah. game object. In That's there. the constructor. Oh, yes. Yeah. In the constructor. Yes. The constructor is where we set the initial values for all of the properties, all of the non static properties in our system, in, in this class, right? Yeah. So it makes sense that the point value should be initialized there as well but we have nothing to initialize it with. So, we add that to our list of arguments. This is going to make the compiler complain because we've modified how many parameters this constructor takes. So, 
a nice little a nice little uh, thing you can do actually. Once you've made a modification like this, use the error messages to your benefit. Each one of those these is giving you the line numbers you have to fix. Right? So just go to those line numbers and fix the things. So let's go. Here we go. How many points should a blocker be worth? One. How about a hundred? Okay. Uh, you gotta you gotta make the player feel important, right? Um, but yeah, like one, two, or three should be a hundred, two hundred, three hundred. This is how pinball scoring works, you know. Um, so, how about the shooter? How many points should the shooter be worth? Probably five hundred. Five three hundred and five hundred. Split the difference. Four hundred. How many points should the boss be worth? One thousand. Yeah, I think so. There we go. Some extra team under if you can use Mm-hmm. Which is good. Yes. And let's just take the mo take a moment to um, to remind ourselves of the syntax here. Uh, just because like I kind of like didn't completely read this line as I was modifying it. So <clears throat> the way that C sharp passes parameters on to the base class in its constructor, it has this extra bit at the end, colon, the keyword base, and then the list of parameters to be sent. Now these values can be taken from our list of parameters as x and y are, and sprite is, they can also be literals. So in the case, this case, two and four hundred, right? Two for hit points, four hundred for points, right? Um, not all of these have to be represented here. You can see the bullet game object is not passed on to the base class, but used only by the shooter class. Make sense? So far, so good? All right, um, that should be everything required. Now, I think I have to actually clear the screen to, uh, to get the, um, got some null reference exceptions going on, which is kind of if I were actually making this game is I would like wire up like a keyboard shortcut. I would say if input dot get key co or key code key code dot k then kill all of these. <laughs> no, that's totally what I do. As long as you disable that in the release version, you're fine. Yeah. But give yourself a cheat code. Actually, that's the origin of most cheat codes in video games. It's like developer workarounds to try to get debugging times faster. Um, <clears throat> see if everything is working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. So, there you go. Note that the game info class is accessible from everywhere, any class, all its methods, all its values. Um, Make sense? Good. Um, cool. What time is it? It's 3.09. Okay. Um, I will answer whatever questions about Lab 3 that you have accumulated, and if we have time after that, I will show you how to uh, hook those up to a um, 
uh, GUI components. Um, just quickly, just uh, it's it's kind of it's a thing that you really should know how to do in Unity, you know. But um, yeah. yeah. All right. So who wants to start? Please. I'll turn this back on if I start talking again. You will upload it. So we're going to do a very brief, because we only got eight minutes left. Uh, I'm going to show you how GUI components work. You know what GUI stands for? Guided user interface. Uh, graphical user interface. Oh. Yeah. So Unity has two layers. It has the 3D layer, which is you know, slash the 2D layer, like the game, is that, it is recording, right? Should have a big red button on it. Yep, it's recording. Um, so Unity has like the part that we've been playing with so far. It also has what it calls the canvas layer, which is an overlay, right? It's a 2D overlay that goes over everything. You can create, uh, where is it? Oh man, where did they hide it? Sample scheme, yes. Renderer, which you know, mm -hmm. I don't like the fact I'm having to do this manually. But basically, everything that's on the canvas has to be a uh, sub object of the canvas. So, um, yeah, see, I've got a, a different type of transform for sub objects of a canvas, it's a rectangle transform which allows you to like set the reference point to like the bottom right corner or something, um, which is you know somewhat useful some of the time. But um, Surrender. It's like a, do I have all my components installed? That's an interesting question. Interesting. That would be a reason the drop down wasn't popping up. Oh, OK. 
Okay. You know what? I think that it might just be that my my information might be. No, I think that's fine. Nope. That's not what I'm looking for. Let's try this. Professor wants just the cone, right? Not the reflection. Just the reflection and the assets in the table. Okay. With screenshots. Oh, uh, screenshots. <laughs> Second time, so I'll just For example, the Every day. No. No, no. It's only from the fact that anything after the mid Oh, really? So you should get out of plane and. Yeah, no, it's not, not installed. He needs to do that. Something will be not there, or it's going to be. What? So we should ask him to do something in the tour. Please. So then five need to is ask him five to, to do something about the midterm. Five but I don't think he's going to know. So he's going to no. teach nine on Nine on the yeah. 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 Oh, But so still, last month. the, the oh, midterm was like 30%. It's not going to. Well, yeah. Unless we get 100 on the final. If I get 100 on the exam, then I'll probably get, I'll get 70 in the exactly. course. So That's why I, I was like. It's but basically impossible, and it's going for 60 at this point. I've got 70. So what? What? Sorry. We were discussing about he, how so he should do something about the midterm. Then it was a disaster. Yeah. And it's worth so much that. For example, I, I calculated if I get 100% on the exam, I'll probably have like between 70 and 75 as well. It is okay. Which is, which is impossible. Yeah, so to get I'm, I'm getting for a 60. I need at least a 200 <laughs> on the <laughs> exam. <laughs> I need a 200 on the exam. To what? To pass. No, to like get a good mark. Oh. Well, but like, but I'm hoping to point. get like pass on exam, and then like you know maybe I it's impossible to get eighty on hundred you, anymore. Yeah. It's and that's fine. It's like you don't have to get eighties in all courses. If you have one course that's kind of crappy or a couple of courses that are kind of crappy, as long as you pass and everything else is it's in like place, a that's, unless you have that's enough normal. to move like, on that's, to the that's next. Totally normal. Unless you have enough to move on to the next semester the or next year. Is, the thing is, it should, it, like, you know. It all balances out. You're never going to mm -hmm. use it. You're never going to take it again. So just get through it. That's what the conclusion is. The model is. <laughs> like, when I, like, I feel it. There like, they are. Sorry. No. I had to, like, custom install it. We're out of time in the class now. I had to go into the package manager and, like, get Unity UI. That's, that should be installed by that default. I'm sorry. But there you go, there's the drop down that was missing that I wanted. So you install a canvas, right? As subcomponents of that canvas, you add, for example, um, an image, right? You can set that to a sprite. And basically, the way the canvas works is like, it thinks that each unit is a pixel, which is why you get this huge expanded view in the editor. But like, you know, 
you can move this guy according to the rex transform and give slightly different, you know, if you do it like registering at the bottom point, you can set it so it's like, you know, 40 pixels from one corner or 40 pixels from the other corner so that it's like nicely aligned at all times, no matter what the screen size is. Um, and if you play it, that image is 40 pixels, 40 pixels, regardless as to how you grow or shrink the screen, it is always at that correct point, right? Does that make sense? So that's, like, this is a layer over top, right? This is not, you can think of this like, the main camera is, has all the action. This is like a, this is like a sticker on the camera's lens, right? So, all that is fine. The other thing, I, I know class is over, but if you wouldn't find, mind bearing with me for just a moment. Um, the other thing that you can do is, um, There's like texts, text items as well. Legacy, ah, there we go. Text, input field, button, etc. They think it's legacy now. Oh man. So, if you want to, uh, for example, say, could we output to the text box? Precisely. So it's like Visual Basic again. Mm. Um, it's like, you still have to do it with script, right? But you can basically, if you grab text component.text and modify the value, you're modifying the value in there, right? Which allows you to actually output like the level of scoring. So, yeah. Um, so you can actually see stuff on screen rather than just through the bloody debug console. And this way, the final users of your end product can actually see what you see. It's a real game. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Uh, they do have like a newer, fancier way of doing this. Clearly, they seem to be trying to deprecate this system, but. Um, the new system is like much more codey and more complicated, and they don't have like a good user interface for it. But um, the other thing that you can do is buttons. Button. You can trigger methods from these in scripts. So, yeah. That's cool. Now I remember that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's it's it's not just it's not just spaceships. You can also do useful stuff. Um, like make a calculator. Oh, everybody loves doing a calculator. Nobody does it right, you know. Uh, nobody like goes to the level of like. How many registers does a calculator actually have? You know? It's like you got one for data, you got one for an opcode, that's it. Everything else is button presses. Anyway. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll I'll let you go. Sorry, sorry that took so long, but they they hit it on me. They made me download it from the internet. I knew it wasn't there when it should have been. It should have been there. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at these people changing things. <sighs> Terrible. Should be ashamed of themselves. Unity, you're thinking about deprecating the UI library, and you shouldn't. Shame on you. Oh, uh, yeah, let me, um, let me pull that up. <clears throat>